Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian podcast, uh, whose two grumpy old men are still at least one generation younger than the two old coots who are at this moment anyway, still running for president in these United States. I am Matt Welch, joined by the AFOR referenced Nick Gillespie plus Peter Suderman and Catherine Mangu Ward. Hi, everyone. Howdy. Hey, Matt. Happy Monday. Uh, we are going to pick up on that quizzical end of Monday question mark in Peter Suderman's voice uh, here in a moment. But first, a word from our sponsors, friends over at Students for Liberty. The most important ideas are those debated on college campuses. Think about how many different fringe concepts initially spawned in the academy that are now prevalent across society. F.A. Hayek noticed this phenomenon. The ideas developed in academia soon spread to the rest of society. That's why Students for Liberty support students like me in spreading the ideas of liberty on campuses. As a coordinator with SFL, I've hosted high-profile speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day, published magazines and articles to spread pro-liberty ideas, and helped organize and attend conferences on campuses around the world. SFL connected me with partner organizations, and thanks to SFL, I've been accepted to internships at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, National Review, the Cato Institute, and will start as an assistant editor at Reason Magazine this summer. My name is Jack McCastro, and I'm one of the thousands of volunteers from the SFL network building a freer future for people across the globe. Visit spreadliberty.org to discover how you can contribute to building a freer future at school and beyond. Okay, well, it looks like everything changed on Thursday night, or perhaps better stated, the big thing most Americans already suspected became irreversibly impossible to publicly deny with a straight face, though not for lack of trying, apparently. And that is Joseph Robinette Biden II has experienced obvious age-related cognitive decline in such a way that definitely alarms Americans' overseas allies, probably makes him unlikely to win another presidential campaign against Donald Trump. Yeah, I said it. And arguably suggests that he's not particularly fit to be commander in chief right now uh, in a debate against an opponent who literally always says crazy things. Biden attracted almost all of the attention uh, with his confused, gaping mouth and blurted non sequiturs such as I beat Medicare. Uh, Catherine, ex- I- I'm so excited. <laughs> that was the, like I know I know we're we're supposed to wait to get to the policy section. Yeah, why? But why start now? Like that's the biggest policy news in history. Would you say it, it's, it, it's frankly, a big fucking being, deal? It's a Is it's a huge talking? deal, and it's well, and that like, was good. All Biden, of this, all of this discussion about Biden's cognitive decline, like that's the B story as far as I'm concerned. Beating Medicare, we won, we did it. It happened. We're going to talk about policy in the B block as advertised ahead of time on Slack. Uh, but the A block, we are going to mention this, uh, this just what we watched, how we processed. Catherine, I know you have no heart as a robot, uh, but did you experience any feelings about or on behalf of uh, America whilst uh, attempting to uh, watch that debate on Thursday? You know, the primary feeling that I experienced was I told you so. Like, this is what happens when you center your politics around uh, you have to vote for the least bad option. This is what happens when you are risk averse and you sort of say the other side is so evil. We have to do anything in order to uh, maximize our chances of beating that other evil side, including lying to the American public, possibly for years, about whether or not the president is competent. And, um, you know, I think you're right when you said no one is shocked. No one is like genuinely surprised to learn like old man is old. We knew. Um, I also think he's probably not like that all the time. Right. I mean, all of us have our our, uh, you know, old people in our orbit and we know that they they come and go. So we might have just caught him at a bad moment. But like, you know, North Korea might catch him at a bad moment. And that's irrelevant. <laughs> yeah, I, I think Stalin caught FDR at a bad moment. Right. At Yalta. Yeah. So. Uh, Nick, let's pick up on that lying uh, bit um, that Catherine referenced. Uh, the White House staff uh, has had a uh, Biden management strategy that they call Operation <laughs> Bub- Bubble Wrap, uh, which limits his unscripted encounters and makes him available to reporters less than any president in our lifetimes, uh, keeps his public speaking engagements between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., 
uh, and make sure that Dr. Jill Biden always has uh, a physical or metaphorical arm on his uh, or hand on his arm. Uh, this has been all been known for many, many months. Um, uh, and yet there's been a cohort among Democrats and journalists to insist that Biden has the strength of 10 men and et cetera. Do you have some thoughts, Nick, about the gaslighting that has taken place before, during and after this debate? <laughs> I, I'm I'm less interested in the concept of gaslighting and more in just holding people accountable. So you know when when uh, newscasters like Joe Scarborough, who you know went on any number of kind of extended perorations about how you know Joe Biden isn't just fit, he is better than he was in 1972. You know, and all of that kind of stuff. Like I would love to see the ramifications of people who were just either so delusional that they should not be taken serious or they're lying so much that they should not be taken seriously. The people around him, weirdly, I give them more of a pass because I'm assuming that his inner cadre, uh, you know, or the, the, the phalanx of idiots around him, and this is also true of Donald Trump, you know, it's a mix of wish, you know, projection and delusion and, uh, and true belief. Like, I don't, I think the people around Joe Biden knew uh, you know, may not have known the extent of how bad he is, partly because they see him every day. And so the decline is less obvious. Any of us with older parents, uh, you know, if you see them every day, they don't decline in the same way as if you see them once every, you know, six months or every year or something like that. Um, but I think it's it's worth holding people accountable for this. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I'll throw in there uh, b before we go to actual policy stuff, there is the question, like I, when I was watching this, I did not feel, you know, like I have a dark sense of humor. This made me deeply sad, um, you know, and it's not just I, I don't want to equate Trump and Biden, but like the fact that this, you know, 159 years of powerful maleness, this is what we're voting on is beyond funny. It's just sad and depressing. And it's a, you know, it's a it's a flair that the <coughs> the country really needs to kind of figure out how do we get to the next act? Because this this is really, really screwed up and it should not be allowed to be kind of normalized in any meaningful way. We have two people who are not particularly good at representing anything about America, and one of them is going to be elected president. So, uh, Speaking of the sad bit, uh, Eugene Volokh over at the Volokh Conspiracy, which uh, is run on the reason.com website. Um, is a longtime friend of mine. Um, not that that's any here or there, but uh, he just he wrote a very beautiful piece, I think, uh, reaction to this. It was basically uh, reached Nick's conclusion like, this is sad. Um, sad for just to watch it on a personal level and real sad for America. And just kind of like he expressed a grumpiness um, uh, and a crestfallenness that, uh, that resonates, I think, with a lot of people. Peter, I want to float to you my Emmanuel Macron theory of the case and get your reaction just sort of thinking about how Democrats uh, are like scrambling to figure out how to respond about this. So Emmanuel Macron uh, so over the weekend. You know, before we go here, you know, I've never been to France. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Like, uh, I have no, I'm not, I'm not French. I have no. Let's, let's imagine. Have you ever like, had French dressing on a salad? Probably uh, for breakfast. I ate frogs on a French island once. I don't okay. Know. Let's imagine for a second that, um, uh, that I knew uh, uh, your uh, life a little bit uh, so that I could prepare a question. Um, so uh, Emmanuel Macron over the weekend uh, held a snap of first election, uh, parliamentary election, and got thumped. He uh, His party came in third place. Uh, National Front came in first place. We'll see how that plays out. But it was it's a shock to the system. Macronism is over. In the French context, uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, he didn't come from a political party. He was just a attractive-ish young uh, guy who was there uh, a few years ago to stave off the National Front. He was the sort of establishment person-ish guy to say, hey, look, we just can't go there with National Front. We need me or you know some grouping around here to put off that day when the bad thing gets elected. Um, so in that sense, um, uh, my theory of the case is that Joe Biden was that in 2020. He wasn't the answer to the Democrats' long-running kind of struggle for their soul. He famously said in the September 2020 first debate that I am the Democratic Party now. Uh, Trump was trying to make him wear Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. 
But uh, he was this candidate that that people like rallied around because they thought he could beat Donald Trump. He could stop the bad thing from happening. So my Macron theory of the case is that they didn't come up with another theory uh, of how to stop the bad thing from happening. And so the people who are engaging in this type of behavior now and insisting he's the only uh, bulwark uh, here, part of the reason that they're doing that is they just didn't figure out how to have someone else be that person who could stop the bad thing from happening. Um, so in light of the, all of that, Peter, knowing nothing about France and not asking you to know anything about France, how do you think Democrats are approaching this moment and what needs to be a succession plan B, uh, whether or not they have reached that conclusion? I think they are approaching it with terror and with great anxiety and, uh, you know, possibly some some uh, some very wet sheets overnight because man this is it's not working for them this there's there's some truth to this biden i think was the his, the biggest appeal for biden was that he uh, he he was that bridge he was going to be the the person who bought the party time to figure out what it stood for but they had four years and they didn't figure out what it stood for. And in fact, by not standing for anything, Biden has blocked the party from figuring out. Because if you look at what Biden has done as president, at basically every point, he's just sort of said, let's find the the median, the midpoint of the Democratic Party, and then stuff all the things, right? Like you look at every piece of legislation that Biden has pushed himself, you know, again, yes, they come from Congress, but in many ways they have, uh, the White House has been very influential here. And it's just, let's stuff it all into one. And that's right, it's it's all going to be in there. And we're not going to pick, we're not going to prioritize, we're not going to choose. Uh, every, every one of the groups gets their box checked. And uh, and, and so in, in some ways, Biden was going to be that bridge, but he was a bridge to nowhere. And unlike the original bridge to nowhere, the Biden presidency is not going to be effective as a slogan for ending earmarks. But he he was ideological. I mean, like this is he, he ran, you know, on 11 trillion dollars in new spending and really sprinted towards that goal, you know, especially for, a, you know, a guy that old. Um, that is absolutely so, correct. But he was also he he was the most moderate of the plausible contenders uh, for the Democratic nomination in 2020. He was he was not a small government or sort of, you know, center, even center right type Democrat, nothing like that. He wasn't a blue dog. That's that's not correct. What he was was not a progressive. He was not a, a leftist. He was not AOC. He was not part of the squad. He wasn't even Elizabeth Warren. He was going to incorporate those folks into his vision of the Democratic Party. But he was an old school, big government liberal. And they've tried that for four years and just totally independent of Joe Biden's competency issues. Big government liberalism, as we have seen it uh, under Joe Biden, is not popular because Joe Biden and the Joe Biden economy and the Joe Biden agenda have not been popular for the last Last four years. Uh, Catherine, um, let's imagine for a second um, a world uh, that is governed by some of the floated replacements for Joe Biden on a presidential ticket. Uh, Kamala Harris, uh, Gretchen Whitmer. Uh, I don't know what other names you've seen. Uh, Michelle Obama, uh, Steve Bannon's idea. Gavin um, Newsom. Gavin Newsom, of course. I've, I've, I've forgotten the that. Yeah. Who's right. the old man now? Uh, I just kind of assume that that is beyond the pale, um, but maybe I'm kind of wrong about that. Uh, any uh, libertarian upsides to any of the floated names? Oh, God, no, no. I mean, this, this is and like, this is the place actually where I feel sympathy for, um, for the kingmakers, whoever they might be within the Democratic Party is, it's not like they were sitting on a treasure trove of alternatives. Like I do get that. Um, that's their fault, too, of course, right? And this phenomenon you're describing in which Biden's kind of um, semi-content-free moderation, particularly as he presented to the American public in the last election cycle, prevented the party from reorienting itself. So anyone who might have brought some exciting new ideas, maybe even some libertarian ones, into the mix, um, A wasn't positioned to succeed in doing that and B might might well not be bothering until the next cycle, right? I mean, if I were an up and coming Democratic Party politician, which does require a quite a stretch of imagination on my part, um, I would I would be sitting quietly and waiting for this mess to be over. I would not want to be implicated in any of this. And so what that leaves you with is people like 
Kamala Harris, who, uh, as Reason has long since established, is a cop and will certainly not be bringing libertarianism to the White House should Biden be reelected and then kick it or otherwise hand off to her. I think it's also worth thinking about, you know, that this performance, uh, which was stunning and shocking, deeply disheartening, regardless of who you are, with the possible exception of Xi or uh, Putin, um, you know, it may not matter as much as we think it does right now. Um, there was, a, you know, Biden had a, a burst of uh, campaign finance uh, funding come in after this. And it's the type of thing strategically, one of the reasons they did it this early was so that you can start to memory wipe it, especially if he shows up over the summer, uh, has a good convention, and then does a good second debate. And there's a long history. I mean, this is off the charts in terms of bad, but there's a long history of incumbent, old incumbent presidents in particular, and I'm thinking of Reagan in 1984, doing unbelievably poorly in a first debate and then kind of rallying around and, you know, not only looking good, but actually winning re-election. I think Biden has trouble beyond any of that kind of stuff. But we're all assuming that, you know, this is so bad that like he's got to be replaced or it's all over and things like that. And remember, this was not just Joe Biden's, you know, day in the sun. It was Donald Trump who had a very good performance, you know, from a rhetorical perspective because he did not go insane in any clear way. Um, but the, the, the program was set up in a way that minimized that chance for him. We haven't seen that much Donald Trump. Uh, over the past few years because of him not being on Twitter and things like that. And Trump is one of those people, the more you see him, the more you're kind of like, oh, yeah, I remember why I didn't vote for him the first time or I won't vote for him the second time. Um, I, you know, I came out of this debate kind of like, OK, Trump is would be a better choice, I think, than than Biden. But, you know, he he has yet to explode in the way that he will almost certainly like 15 times between now and election day. The place that you come out of this debate, like maybe it's Trump would be a better choice. Maybe it's Biden had a bad day and he's still a better choice. You know, I think I saw a lot on Twitter of like, um, sure, this one was a doddering old man who needs a lozenge, but that one is a filthy liar who's also a fascist, right? Like that's that was sort of the probably the most robust response. But uh, again, don't you feel like the, the main thing that you come away with is just like, no, neither of them. Absolutely. Like everyone's a double yeah. hater now or should be if they have eyes in their head. Yeah, I agree with you with that, but one of them or one of them from their parties is going to be the president. So, you know, it's also kind of like, okay, you can hate, um, but you know, that's not going to change the uh, choices at the top of the ticket. So I just want to push back a little bit on what you said at the beginning of your response there. Uh, the right, like it is possible that the, um, the very negative reaction to this debate will fade uh, and that the, the the sort of the big turn that we have seen in the media, even amongst Democratic partisans or Democratic organs, that that a month from now, they'll be saying, well, maybe it's not that big a deal. But I do think uh, that this is different than previous presidential debates where the incumbent has had a bad first debate or even something like January 6th, where you saw Republicans turn on Trump the, you know, the day after the riot um, at the Capitol. And there was just universal condemnation nation. And six months later, it was like, ah, eh, maybe that's not that big a deal. He's our man. Right? Or with um, his conviction. But, right. There's there is a there is a big difference here. And that is that Joe Biden's age related problems are not going to go away. January 6th was very, very bad, but it happened one time. And it wasn't happening again a month later, two months later, three months later. And we're very likely to see these moments happen again. We know that they have been happening because we have seen reporting in the Wall Street Journal, which interviewed Kevin McCarthy, yes, but also something like 45 other sources about Biden's decline. The New York Times was reporting on this a year ago. Ezra Klein, who is quite connected in the Democratic establishment, called for the Democrats to rethink Biden and Biden to maybe step down earlier this year. This is not something that is uh, that just came out of the blue that is just a one night thing. This is something that very clearly has affected Joe Biden. I mean, and it is it is something also that people can relate to in a direct and personal way, because this is a take the keys away from grandpa moment, right? This is everybody understands. Uh, everybody has had an older person in their life slip somewhat and has seen that and understands how sad it is, but also that that person cannot operate and cannot function. And I mean, again, the, the keys metaphor, I think, is actually pretty operative here. And I was thinking about this, like as a just because Joe Biden's a car guy, right? We associate him with that that silly Corvette he keeps in the garage with all the top secret documents. And 
the one thing I was wondering, and maybe this is like actually the case for Biden here, is it, like if he's not president anymore, he's going to be driving that Corvette around, and that's <laughs> going to be really dangerous. I and maybe, it. maybe, the, uh, maybe f- like Americans have a duty to reelect Joe Biden to keep mm-hmm. him off the road. No, we're not. Uh, gonna. You know, to go with the taking the keys away. The question is, who's going to do it? Because Biden is the apex here and, you know, Jill Biden could do it. And that's about it. Um, So that I think is part of the problem. There's there's not a procedure in place. My contempt. Yeah. Biden has to make this decision himself unless he's totally incapacitated. Lady uh, is uh, is is pretty much bottomless at this point. If you see the clips of her talking right after the debate and like, you did a great job, Joe. You answered all the questions. It just was so. Uh, cringe inducingly condescending and managerial and man don't like it doesn't seem to be uh good wifing uh all right let's go to some of the substance um that we've teased a little bit so far policy you know what she ha- was doing uh, just on the jill biden thing we interrupt should just, me more, like Peter. she is a teacher yes i'm gonna do that she yeah. is a teacher and like a union teacher lady and she reminded me of the teachers union leaders defending the crap teachers after they have done like the absolute worst thing. It is the exact same playbook and even just the same presentational style. Uh, it is, it's just grating and unpleasant. But I think that like coming from that labor teacher education background, we see how that, how that plays out uh, it, in terms of how she is handling this. All right, let's go quicker than projected on substance of policy debates um, that happened at the debate. I'm sure there was at least a few. Um, at least the topics were uh, substantial. I don't know about the discussion. Uh, we're each going to pick one. Peter, you start with tariffs. Yeah. So the there was this great moment where uh, Donald Trump was like, man, Joe Biden, just terrible on China with the tariffs. Not really acknowledging that what Biden has done is just keep Trump's tariffs in place. So as far as I can tell, the logic of Donald Trump's position is, boy, Joe Biden is just ruining things by not removing the tariffs that I implemented. And that is about the quality of the the policy substance that we saw on stage at thurs- on Thursday night. Catherine, you're a lady. Um, did you see anything of interest having to do with abortion? <laughs> I sure did. Uh, right, right near the top of the debate, there was this yeah. divor- this abortion question, and you know that's that makes sense because abortion has been a major, major issue in our nation uh, during Biden's first term and would be relevant to an incoming president. And Biden said a series of utterly incomprehensible <laughs> things, and I really don't want us to like lose track of like, oh, he's old and he's confused, whatever. No, he, that, yeah, he's he said first. Well, we'll get back to the first part of his answer. The second part of his answer, he like uh, developed an entirely novel theory of the three trimesters of a pregnancy. The first time is between a woman and her doctor. The second time is between a doctor and an extreme situation. The third time is between the doctor, I mean the woman, and the state. What? What? <laughs> I mean, in a way, the third time is between the doctor and the state is in fact true, right? Like, that is the moment in which we decide whether or not to criminalize the behavior and it becomes between the doctor and the state. I don't think that Donald Trump was doing like a deep analysis of the relationship between the state and the doctor. I think he lost his mind. Um, But that is not that was not the worst part of the answer is the most remarkable part. The worst part of the answer was when he started kind of explaining his his basic position and got diverted into talking about immigrant rape. And it for sure felt like someone said, okay, Donald Trump's going to talk about immigrants and rape. Don't let him do that. Talk about abortion instead or something. And Biden was like something about the rape and the immigrants. And he just started talking like I, that's the only thing that makes sense. A lot of young women are being raped by their in-laws, by their by their spouses, brothers and sisters, by it's just ridiculous. It was just ridiculous. I mean, you can see where he was going with that. He was trying to bring the abortion issue back to instances where someone has been uh, raped or the health of the mother, which, uh, like, you know, is and a everybody hates, point. And everybody right? hates yes. their in-laws. So he's just trying to, you know, get he, that in the mix. Right? It's such an important issue. It was um, such a great example of why the country is not safe in this man's hands. Like, if he is if he is the, the last bulwark protecting uh, the bodily autonomy of women, like, it's bad news. 
I'm thinking 23andMe should add, you know, they could upcharge for this a thing where you can find out how much incest is in your family tree. I think people are going to be, they're primed for that now. Yes, dark sense of humor, uh, Nick. Yeah, you did mention that at the top. Um, do you, uh, Nick, uh, Catherine brought up uh, raping immigrants. Uh, what did you yeah. hear about immigration? And uh, to be clear, it was the illegal immigrants who were doing the raping. It's yes, not, undocumented. You know, yeah. Come on. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's, you know, that is a big, um, uh, you know, kind of topic. And uh, Trump insisted again and again, he said, I want a deportation, uh, a deportation, we will begin the largest deportation program in history. And that, you know, we didn't really spend a lot of time and by we, I mean, the country, uh, because everybody was so fraught by Joe Biden. And, you know, when he would go into that kind of mini trance where he would be like, ah, and I was expecting like whole bodies of homunculi to come out of his mouth somehow because he was in like a psychic. I mean, he was like a medium, right? From, uh, you know, Harry Houdini. It was like the Hieronymus medium or something. debate. Yeah. yeah. Um, and But the the actual substance of, of you know, th- what was being talked about, particularly on the side of Trump, went, you know, kind of unremarked on. He kind of fudged his way through a pretty good abortion answer, which was like, oh, yeah, yeah, it should go back to the States. That was my idea all the time. Um, you know, he's kind of he I think he was trying to signal to people like I'm not going after your abortion bills. Uh, but, you know, the immigration stuff is is, you know, really hot. Uh, Biden has essentially conceded a lot of Trump's immigration policy, certainly towards the border and things like that. He kind of soft pedaled the fact that he was talking about extending green cards uh, to um, uh, people who are mar- uh, uh, undocumented immigrants who are married to people who are American citizens and have a history of being here. Donald Trump, you know, the Donald Trump who was in the on the All In podcast where he talked about immediately giving people who graduate from community colleges, much less, uh, you know, four year colleges or graduate programs, a green card that's gone. And I think we saw a preview of how the immigration issue is going to be used by Donald Trump in particular to force a stark uh, division between Democrats and Republicans. And it worries me because that the discussion of large scale deportations is, you know, that is deeply, deeply disturbing. My uh, policy uh, interest in this debate, such as it was, uh, was a foreign policy, which was a bit jumbled and there wasn't a whole lot of it, but it was a reminder and this is especially salient, I think, to libertarians, um, including the capital L version of libertarians who tend to list kind of in the direction of Donald Trump, um, uh, that the choice between these two guys is not a choice between someone who is anti-war and someone who is, you know, part of the war machine. Um, it's between someone who's just doing kind of the exhausted end of American empire. You know, we are the United States of America. Nothing is beyond our capacity um, uh, talks and we're rebuilding our alliances. Uh, how many decades have we heard of that? That's uh, Biden and, and Trump, who's a Jacksonian. He is not an anti-war candidate. He is someone who is like Andrew Jackson, sort of irritable. Um, if someone pisses him off, he's going to kill him kind of a way of looking at foreign policy. And that can lead to some opposition to certain wars or things that the war machine likes. But it can also lead him to conclude, as he did uh, at the debate vis-a-vis Israel, which is not a particularly popular country among the most vociferously anti-war people in the United States. Um, Trump's comments was, you should let them go and finish the job. Um, And he said he doesn't want to do it. And then said of Biden, he's become like a Palestinian. (laughs) Sorry to laugh. It's just he says crazy things. And I still find it at least kind of exasperatingly funny. He's become like a Palestinian, but they don't like him because he's a very bad Palestinian. Uh, He's a weak one. See, where is the lie? Uh, There were lots of lies, but that I I mean, Matt, did you think his foreign policy? I mean, like on the, the foreign policy stuff, didn't Trump come across as much more uh, you know, like you, you felt more confident in his ability to not to have the world end in flames than under Biden. No, yeah. um, uh, no. I didn't have any. And no, I mean, like uh, I disagree with Trump about uh, Ukraine. Um, uh, he didn't really say anything about Ukraine one way or the other, except for his usual go to wouldn't have happened under me. Um, and he also said that like uh, the the 
deals uh, or the, the deal points that are on the table are unacceptable. He didn't really talk about how or why, um, but I have a different uh, view on that than, uh, generally speaking, the view of the case. He, he recites Russian propaganda about the Ukraine war, um, that it was all because NATO expanded too much. Um, and that's not what it all was about. And that view, I think, is incorrect. Um, so no, I don't. I don't feel, given that uh, Vladimir Putin is a menace, um, I don't feel great about that. Uh, Trump's differentiation in Israel and the Middle East is that he's really anti-Iran, and uh, Biden is not pro, but like has this Biden-esque Democratic Party accommodationist sort of uh, view. Um, uh, I, I'm probably more on the anti, but like it's how how it works out. Uh, uh, who knows? Um, you know, I think Donald Trump has more uh, obvious like um, uh, command of his facilities. So if that's your overriding concern, I can see that. But I don't you know. It's it, it's not uh, no one wins is is my kind of uh, point of this, that there isn't the the neither side um, has for a long time articulated a post Cold War view of American foreign policy. Trump never has. Uh, and Biden certainly never has as well. Um, and so that's what we're going to continue to be in until uh, someone actually thinks about this more than sloganeering either of America first over and over again, um, or just that we're going or to keep, America you know, last say it, or, Matt. come on. <laughs> Biden thinks of America. last. Now I, you know, for me, the thing that ultimately made me really dislike Biden in this was in the final statement, Biden could have given a vision of the America that he sees as his legacy. And he did. He, you know, he did, he did not articulate anything other than a, a bunch of kind of like random gotchas, you know, 45 minutes too late in the debate. And it seems to me, you know, that's, you know, part of the problem. We, it's not just American empire is running out and we have two guys who don't really under, either understand that or know how to manage a shift from a more unipolar world to a multipolar world or you know what any of this means but Biden's absolute lack of a positive vision of America at the end was like wow this is you know he is totally out of gas all right we're going to get to our listener email uh, of the week here in a moment but first friends do you ever find yourself like um at a presidential debate watch party where the need for self-medication spikes upward just as the wine runs out and the mixology cocktails start appearing magically in your bottomless glass? In that hypothetical scenario, uh, how would you feel the next day? I'm guessing not very productive, but it didn't, I, I mean, it doesn't have to be this way because of a terrific new product called <laughs> Z-Biotics. Zbiotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Zbiotics your first drink of the night, then drink responsibly and you'll feel your best tomorrow. Just go to zbiotics.com slash roundtable right now to get 15% off your first order. When you use the promo code roundtable at checkout, there's a hundred percent money back guarantee. If you are unsatisfied in any way, no questions asked. That's zbiotics.com slash roundtable, promo code roundtable. Do it today. Next time, you'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder to email your queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Joey Grizzlack, who writes, love the show and the cultural recommendations. Thank you. Quick question. Do we have to vote for Biden now that he freed Assange? This is obviously just a way to smuggle in discussion of uh, Julian Assange um, uh, pleading with the feds to get out of jail, uh, playing guilty on one uh, account. Uh, Catherine, how would you answer? And do you have some Assange thoughts? Yeah, my Assange thoughts are I'm, I'm delighted. Free Assange. He's free ish getting there. Almost free, pretty free. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, he's always this kind of, um, slogan or whatever has always held a slightly outsized place in, um, some people's, voting calculus, I guess. Um, you know, it's interesting to me that there are like single issue Assange voters, but they do seem to exist. Um, and this is a good outcome. Did it have much of anything at all to do with Joe Biden? No. Um, so you can feel free to vote or not vote for anyone that you want. 
Catherine, Nick, how much of your Assange support comes from the fact that he was played by Benedict Cumberbatch you in that movie? You have asked me this before, yeah. I, maybe about Assange or maybe about other people that Benedict Cumberbatch has played, and you know the answer, which is like 97% of it. <laughs> Excuse me, Nick. Um, you have thoughts about the denouement of this case that has just been going on for way, no. way, way too long and still involves the Espionage Act somehow? Yeah, I, you know, I think of Assange more as he's like Otto Warmbier. If you remember him, he was a uh, student, a college student from Ohio who was arrested in North Korea for you know, uh, stealing a couple of propaganda posters and came home and his brains were scrambled. You know, I mean, like something had happened to him. I think, uh, you know, that the U.S. government effectively uh, turned Julian Assange through the captivity that they enforced. They were the reason that he was stuck in the places that he was for as long as he was under the conditions he was. You know, it was essentially a long form of psychological torture. And that uh, makes me ashamed to be American to be quite honest, you know, that our government would prosecute somebody like that for what the, you know, the crimes that they said, Matt, you brought up the Espionage Act. Assange was ultimately guilty of committing journalism and of leaking accurate reports, you know, accurate material to the public that had every right to know what its government is doing. Um, and if the government doesn't want people to know what they're doing in secret, they either lock it down better or they don't do things in secret that they would be ashamed of to have come out in public. And the fact of the matter is, particularly with the first WikiLeaks tranche, the U.S. actually looked better than virtually every other country that was involved in that. Um, but uh, so I am glad that Assange is free, but it's, it is a br brutal and grotesque miscarriage of justice. And I worry that that underlying issue, um, you know, what constitutes journalism and the ability to be a, legally to be protected as a watchdog of the government, um, you know, that hasn't been addressed. And we know under Bush, we know under Obama, certainly we know under Trump and we know under Biden, um, you know, this, uh, you know, First Amendment rights to uh, kind of free speech and free expression are they're a moving target at best. Peter, I wonder if there's a uh, uh, an Afghanistan war. Uh, comparison here that I'm just making up and forcing you to respond to, which is to say, um, uh, Obama could end that war. Donald Trump could end that war, even talked about it, but it was Biden who did. And like at the debate, like they were almost vying for not uh, wanting to talk about that. Um, and uh, Assange, the same thing. Obama could have made that go away. Um, just vacated it and like said, stop it. Why are we doing this? Trump could have done that, he even talked about it, had maybe some uh, extra motivation to stop that and somehow didn't. And yet it happens on Biden's watch and he will get politically zero uh, like uh, points for it. Oh, no, I think uh, Libertarian Party members are now required to vote for him. <laughs> <laughs> but they were anyway, right? Yeah, that's true. Deep you know, cut. Uh, uh, once well, the deep... Michael Rechtenwald didn't get the nomination. I mean, you, everybody's pledged to vote for uh, for didn't Trump. Yeah. Trump and Biden definitely were more interested in talking about their golf game. I mean, I guess it's not surprising. We've got these two old guys there. Of course, strokes are going to come up. <laughs> wow. Um, That's a pretty good dad joke. <laughs> finally. Uh, a granddad joke. Yeah. I My money, uh, by the way, is absolutely on Trump on, on the golf contests. Um, and that he off owns golf courses, or yeah, I guess sure maybe does. whatever he doesn't actually. No, but own that's them. also he, people rent his name from him to put on their golf courses. Yeah, but, but it's oh look at that! I won my the uh, championship at the club I own again. Like boy, that's a surprise, right? I think uh, George W. Bush would beat the snot out of both of them uh, to this day, um, but that's just a and then line. paint a picture of it afterwards. I think we With should ask people, uh, you know, or no president like you. No, you're not allowed to play golf. I don't want a golf playing president. Remember mm. there was there that used to be like a thing where it was like the golf counter, like yeah. how much are they playing golf? And like that, that like we I long for the days it. when that was a scandal. Now, I think yeah. during the Trump administration, people were like, please play golf. Like that seems like the place you're going to do the least harm. I it's do the sort of think Calvin Coolidge, like napping president theory. Matt, a modified uh, superstars competition from the uh, late oh, yeah. 70s, early 80s on ABC. Mm -hmm. uh, for presidential candidates, you know, a, a 25 yard swim, an obstacle course, power lifting, bowling, like just 
they get to pick five events that they have to compete in and they have to show that they are capable of something. I would say let's start with can you pass the roadside drunk test just sober because uh, both of those guys are sober again another problem yeah um, uh, maybe and that's take the problem. Z-biotics. yeah um, and then uh, take mm. the cognitive test on live television let's not forget no. that Joe Biden's doctor didn't didn't <laughs> say that do he the was cognitive test. the greatest brain that no the the test that I've seen proposed which I fully support and which would disqualify some people on this podcast is uh, you just have to have them convert a Word doc to a PDF. Get off. You don't even. <laughs> That's I didn't, it. I, That's I didn't the... want to be president. I'm Gen X. And you shouldn't be they if you can't do that. They have government agencies to do that. <laughs> you know? This is like uh, the 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 boomer screening test is uh, should be in effect here. You guys joke now, but 20 years from now, when we have a president who's like spending all of his time playing Fortnite or Call of Duty or something, if and only. that's going to be the that's going to be the story. This is my dream. Like, why? Don't threaten me with a good time. <laughs> uh, speaking of threatening you with a good time, uh, the Supreme Court uh, finished its term today with a batch of sure to be controversial ru- ru- rulings. I guess that's what we call them, um, including uh, uh, on uh, immunity, uh, which I've yet to fully digest, but 6 3 uh, in favor of some uh, presidential uh, immunity uh, as president. The official acts, but uh, the uh, good time that's being threatened is uh, at least a lot of the um, uh, of the uh, of hand gnashing. I'm like, forgetting all oh, the words uh, yeah. having to do with uh, the end of Chevron deference, which is really literally uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch's uh, reason for existing. Uh, they uh, handed down a decision last week about that having to do with the administrative state and what those regulatory agencies can and cannot do in terms of inventing new law. Peter, I know you've written about this and have thought about this. What does and does not uh, last week's Supreme Court decision do in terms of the administrative state and Supreme Court rulings going forward? So since the 1980s, uh, the courts have operated under uh, the Chevron deference, which is uh, which is basically that if there is a statute that is ambiguous, then courts are required to defer to the agency interpretation of that statute. Now, in theory, that sounds pretty reasonable. Courts are not made up of specialist technical experts, and regulatory agencies, for better or for worse, often for worse, rule uh, often on quite technical subjects, and it's, it's just a kind of complicated subject matter expertise intensive sort of activity. And so the idea was, well, let's let the subject matter experts do the interpretation. But in practice, what that meant was that uh, was that regulatory agencies end up going hunting for ambiguity and arguably in some cases just straight up inventing ambiguity and then using that ambiguity to give themselves new powers that are not in the statute. And so Chevron deference has empowered the executive branch to basically write its own ticket to decide what it wants to do, uh, independent of what the statute says. And that has been a huge problem over the last 40 years. The end of Chevron deference means that the courts are going to actually be the ones to interpret those statutes where they are ambiguous. And that gives the courts the opportunity to say to regulatory agencies, you have overstepped your bounds. Your interpretation is not acceptable. Uh, This probably will mean that there are that there will be a bunch of litigation here although John Roberts in his decision did say all these old decisions you can't just relitigate every single one of them but going forward when agencies try to invent uh, basically new powers for themselves by saying well you know the there's this the language here is a little bit fuzzy so we we think we have the wiggle room courts will not automatically be required to accept the agency ruling. That is a good thing. This is a huge win for limited government. Uh, Catherine, uh, we will uh, surely talk uh, more f- in more fullness next week about the Supreme Court's term, but just wonder if you had any quick thoughts about Chevron Gorsuch. Gorsuch I can't pronounce words. Uh, I'm going to take the cognitive test live on television, and boy, am I going to fail. Uh, and, and or the Supreme Court, uh, please talk. Yeah. I mean, I was reminded of the reaction uh, immediately after 
um, the last terms, the um, uh, the EPA case, the Sackett v. EPA, v. EPA um, where there's a certain type of kind of um, technocratic lefty kind of person who thinks of themselves as mainstream, a New York, New York Times liberal kind of person um, who really, really dramatically exaggerated the potential impact of the case uh, in a way that was um, like they wanted to be upset, right? So this was the case about, you know, oh, it had to do with water regulation. And there were people that were like, fine, like the the Clean Water Act is repealed. Our streams will run red with the blood and black with the oil of our children. Like it was, <laughs> it was like a real kind of apocalyptic take. And similarly with this case, like I think that this case was rightly decided, but it did not gut the administrative state. It like in marginal cases created a different mechanism for resolving ambiguity. This is not like the the world will not be radically changed by this decision. It's important, but it's not the end of government as we know it. And I think you know this had that same feel of like a lot of big feelings about something that was ultimately a bit technical. It matters. It definitely matters, but it doesn't it doesn't matter in the way that people who wanted to be upset about it wanted it to matter. Though it's pretty funny, those New York Times liberal types that are upset about this are worried that the admitted, that the executive branch might end up with an awful lot less power. They're also terrified that Donald Trump is going to be president and, and use the executive branch, which would have bad powers under Donald Trump. It's like, pick one. Either you want the executive branch to have a lot of power and baked into that is that someone like Donald Trump might win the presidency. Or you want to say, May maybe the executive branch, maybe the presidency should have a lot less power. And that would just be a good thing, no matter who was in the Oval Office. Well, and we have the court, you know, incrementally rolling back some of some of these kind of powers of executive branch agencies, uh, at the same time that the American right broadly speaking, is pivoting toward, actually, we should have a lot of executive power and we should just seize it and use it for our own ends. So that's the other thing is like, these the Supreme Court justices are ideologically lagging the current American right. They are, they're the, the kind of intellectual right that, that's pre-Trump in many ways. Um, and uh, the post-Trump right is going to be annoyed that the justices it worked so hard to get into place are now shackling an executive the next time their guy is in power. One of uh, the things that's interesting is that one of the cases that prompted this ruling was a, a administrative overreach by Trump's uh, White House, uh, having to do with herring fishing and uh, federal monitors on fishing boats and things like that. Trump came into office talking about he was going to take an axe, or maybe Steve Bannon said this for him, to the administrative state. Uh, there wasn't a lot of evidence that he was going to do that. And this is to Catherine's point. This is an important and it's a good decision. But like the Janus decision from a few years ago and a bunch of other decisions like Supreme Court rulings don't change things overnight. They are lagging indicators of where politics either are already or are heading towards. And I think that's important. The problem with the administrative state is not going to be fixed through court rulings. It needs to be fixed by changes in and not in judicial philosophy, but in governing philosophy that are incarnated in the Congress and in the executive branch ultimately. So it's good, but it's not transformative. All that stuff about the fishing regulation, by the way, kind of a red herring. Uh, now you are back in the incredible deficit back, column back. for dad jokes. Back in the penalty box. Uh, all right. Uh, back in uh, the auto warm beer uh, holding lounge. Let's get to our end of podcast, what we have been consuming in the area of culture. Uh, Catherine, why don't you lead us off? So I have been very, very slowly watching all three seasons of Picard, uh, the post, 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 post uh, reboot of the reboot or whatever of uh, Next Generation. And um, I'm not I was not previously a Star Trek consumer. Uh, counter to my general vibes. Uh, so my husband put together for me uh, a kind of package of episodes so that I would know all the characters. And then I just started right at Picard. And this, I feel, is the maximally infuriating way to encounter Star Trek. And so I want to share it with all of our listeners. I've talked to, I've alluded to this before, but I, I have now finished the show. And um, I have two thoughts very briefly. One is this was not a great show to be watching while you are despairing about the fact that the very, very elderly still think they should be in charge of the universe. Uh, like, 
the premise of this show is literally just like the gang gets back together and they're they're all very old and but like only they can save us and uh this this is the kind of fantasy that i fear is keeping joe biden in office or possibly even alive um and it's happening in many other industries as well so that that i think is like a i had some it clashed with the real world in some troubling ways and the the other way it clashed with the real world pause here and skip for a few seconds if you don't want a spoiler um the last episode features a plot that I am not making up in which all of the young people get assimilated by the Borg because they go through the transporters and because their brains aren't fully formed, they're susceptible to like manipulation somehow to become Borg. And literally it is the young people with digital brains zombieing around, ruining everything. And only the very, very old boomers who can drive stick like they literally have to drive the old enterprise (laughs) manually to save the day this is like okay i'm done with the spoilers boomer fantasia at its worst it was so upsetting um also absolutely the writers of that show did a ton of psychedelics two different plots that revolve around opening a door in your psyche like literally a door it was a lot anyway it actually was pretty good and i recommend it but like viewer beware so which Star Trek cast member uh, maps onto which podcast uh, roundtable member here? I, I I guess I'll do the same thing I did I did with Inside Out and say you can yeah. email me you can you can hit me up privately for that analysis. But um, no, you super, know, super. curiously, the original series was also very anti kid, even though it was trying to reach out to the love people, and it makes sense because. Gene Roddenberry, who, you know, his DNA, I mean, like you can't escape it in all of these permutations. He worked for uh, Bill Parker, the longtime ultra law and order, insane police chief of L.A. um, And uh, ultimately didn't really trust the kids with very much. Yeah, I mean, for sure, the kids these days uh, is a theme of this show. Uh, The kids are not all right. Um, And they're not all right in part because of the things that their elders have done wrong and then concealed from them. Uh, Catherine, quick question: um, Do can you, or uh, does your husband al- allow you to uh, drive a stick? <laughs> um, no, and no. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, Nick. What did you consume? Uh, I watched Outstanding, a comedy revolution, which is a documentary by directed by Paige Hurwitz on Netflix, and it is you know it was one of their big Pride releases. Um, so it's outstanding. It's a pun. It's about gay and lesbian and bi and trans and in many cases, unfunny comedians coming out of the closet, either as gay or lesbian or as comedians, uh, because you wouldn't have known that from their routines. I enjoyed this a ton, uh, partly because it showed footage of older people like Lily Tomlin, who spent most of her career when she was on um, uh, certainly on Laughing. Uh, and things like that. And when she was in the terrible movie, uh, I think it was called Moment by Moment with John Travolta, uh, where they were, it was a romantic dramedy. I don't know. It's like a, you know, the filmic equivalent of the Hindenburg. Uh, Check it out when you get a chance. But Outstanding A Comedy Revolution had a lot of really interesting footage of obviously gay and lesbian comics back in the day. And it's you know fascinating when you look at people like Charles Nelson Riley or Paul Lynn or Moms Mabley, um, and you recognize you know with the passage of time and the kind of opening up of American culture what they were and why they seemed off and very funny. Um, and it's a little bit sad, obviously. It's more than a little bit sad that it takes so long for people just to be able to be who they are and live in that and kind of enjoy themselves. Uh, One of the real revelations of this was there was a 1977 uh, uh, um, uh, benefit for gay and lesbian rights where uh, Lily Tomlin got uh, Richard Pryor to participate. And they have some footage of that where Richard Pryor talks about, you know, that he's he's sucked dick like and it's this funny and scathing uh, kind of uh, call out of homophobic America. And then he goes into a question about race relations, though. And it's because this was held in like Hollywood. And he's like, but I see all you white people out there. And it's just it's it's an amazing you know moment. And this documentary is actually filled with things like that, including 
uh, one of the earliest uh, out comedians on TV, a woman named Robin Tyler, who she and her partner had a TV show that then got pulled after she was on the Norm Crosby show. And Matt, oh, you'll remember Norm Crosby God. from like third rate uh, game shows of the 70s. But she was talking about Anita Bryant, who was the you know former Miss America, who was a famously anti-gay and a, a pitch woman for Florida Orange Shoes. And she was talking about born again Christians. And Robin Tyler said, I don't mind them being born again, but do they have to come back as themselves? Which... <laughs> I thought it was like an incredibly funny, mean line. And that was like the end of her TV career. And so I, I recommend Outstanding a Comedy Revolution by Paige Hurwitz. It's, you know, it's, it's a bit triumphalist in many ways, but it is fantastic. And the, the archival footage is just stunning. Um, so that to, was uh, what I watch. To oh, micro. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say this also... I, I watched that, and then you know New York had its and uh, its Pride Parade uh, this weekend, just uh, yesterday, the day before we taped this, and there was there's a subset of that called the Dyke March because uh, you know New York is, has like the longest running Pride March, but the NYCD Dyke March actually put out signs saying masking is resistance, and they were talking about like everybody should wear masks both kafias and kind of, you know, breathing masks or surgical masks, uh, because Gover Governor Kathy Hochul and Mayor Eric Adams are supporting a ban on masks in our state ag against people who are, you know, kind of intimidating people, normally wearing kafias and stuff like that. So they're saying masking is resistance. And they say the 2024, 2024 NYC Dyke March will be a fully mass march. And that shows you kind of what a wonderful world we live in, where we have gone through a phase where being gay or lesbian meant being erased from discussion, if not view, to, okay, we are letting everything all hang out. And now we have dykes who are in favor of regimes that put people to death for being gay or lesbian, talking about masking as an act of resistance against the liberal governor and the liberal mayor of New York, who are in favor of that because they don't want people being intimidated, you know, with the way that the Ku Klux Klan intimidated people in the South with masks. So it's kind of a wonderful world. Um, kind of. I, I, I uh, reminds me uh, in a non sequitur fashion. Uh, I was driving uh, yesterday and 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 hitting the the little button, the scan on the radio there in the car, and uh, and uh, classical music station was playing all day um, classical music from. LGBTQ composers and and performers, hmm. and it just struck me as like, why? Who was the big surprise? I I was I wasn't really about paying a lot of attention, um, but it's just like it's there's no like they're, they're, it's not like they're playing like songs. It's not like it's raining men or anything like that. It's just <laughs> like it's, it's classical music. I don't know. But here, Matt, uh, uh, that oh, question no. of pride oh, when you God. hear an you angel, somebody was this. on the angels. You and and they show up somewhere in a positive way. You're like, oh yeah, like you feel a little bit of pride, right? Because you no. care about the Los Angeles Angels from California slash Anaheim. Frankly, no, but I see what you're saying and I respect it. Uh, Peter, what did you consume? I watched Dark Matter, the TV show on Apple TV Plus that is an adaptation of Blake Crouch's 2016 novel. It's a multiverse story about a man who kind of who gets unstuck from his uh, from his universe. Uh, the novel it is based on is just a fascinating document because it's it's pretty good. It's pretty effective. It's the sort of thing that you can read in like two hours because it is so committed to the one sentence paragraph. Like every sentence has been honed down like to this sort of perfect eighth grade reading level, like just the fewest number of words. There is, I am not making this up. There is an entire paragraph that is just one word and that word is oranges. And that's it. And like the whole book is just like that. So you almost don't feel like you're reading it at all. It's like the least amount of reading that you've ever done in 350 pages or whatever it is. And the TV show is not quite as focused and, uh, you know, in its 
in its accessible simplicity, but it's quite uh, it, it's quite effective. I wouldn't say it's great, but it's pretty good. It's um, it is slick sci-fi. Uh, a lot of it takes place in Chicago, and it was actually shot in Chicago and looks like it. So there is some green screen and some kind of shoddy effects work in the middle couple of episodes, but it, it looks really nice. Uh, but it is a show about what a, about choices in life and sort of posits a world in which every single choice creates yet another universe and a, another branching universe, and so. So you have this character who lives a, a pretty idyllic, um, but in some ways low key life with his family. He's a professor. He has kind of left the corporate world, and then of course he runs into the version of himself that stayed in the corporate world and became a titan of industry and all of this. And it gets a little bit complicated, but you know fundamentally it's about wanting to be back with your family and to have that sort of low key idyllic life. And it's really kind of interesting to watch this in the context of, for example, this presidential election and the debate because you watch them kind of one after each other, uh, like I did last week. And you start to feel like somebody made the wrong choice and you woke up in the wrong universe. And that's how we ended up with the Trump Biden shit show on Thursday. Dark Matter is just the time traveler's wife for men. Um, and it's it's that's not a criticism. It's just the truth. Nothing wrong with being something but for I, I want to see uh, uh, Hunter Biden's multiverse because every time it's the same thing. <laughs> Uh, I mean, there, I did there that is again. I made that, that choice again. There is some of that in this no. book. Like he, yeah. he, I don't know what's in the series, but like he follows a lot of paths that end up in the same place. So uh, I'm going to recommend a uh, a mansion slash estate tour up in the uh, Hudson Valley. Uh, that is uh, one of the better of such uh, things. There, um, it is called the Wilderstein Historic Site. I found it a year or two ago uh, initially. Um, by just taking a right instead of a left uh, of the Rhinecliff Amtrak station, uh, which I recommend people go to. Very, very sweet. Um, and uh, saw this you know, signage and a big old huge Queen Anne mansion thingy uh, and made a mental note to go check it out one day. And that was recent. And it is uh, that area uh, has famously a, a whole bunch of big old mansions up on the banks of the Hudson uh, cliffs, uh, like uh, the Vanderbilt Mansion and Hyde Park FDR stuff and and uh, and, and various. Uh, I think the Morgan Estate is up there, too. Um, this is by far the best uh, view out of all of it. It it, uh, it has a, it's on a little bend of the river. Just really, really gorgeous. Um, so that's one reason to do it. And you can walk along the grounds of about three miles of paths. It's very nice. A deer will come galumphing past you. Um, super beautiful uh, site. Uh, but also uh, uh, two other main reasons. One uh, is that unlike uh, all the FDR business and most, most of the other mansions, um, it hasn't really gone through a series of ownership changes. And so therefore, you can see what the place was decorated like, um, you know, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and in this case, Pretty interesting backstory about the uh, about the place uh, owned by local local grandees who got super rich in like the 1880s and 1890s, and so they remodeled and and made you know the Tiffany designed one of the rooms. Each room was designed differently, really kind of beautiful and ornate. And then the family lost all of its money and never got it back. Um, and so they kind of, it just was dilapidated and was, um, uh, and really just a mess. And, uh, a then 90 year old woman, um, uh, created sort of a, a nonprofit saying, can I just give you this house and you'll preserve it maybe. And hopefully you'll be able to raise money for it. And maybe people will be able to look at it later. And the, uh, Oh Henry twist of the story is that lady, uh, whose name is Daisy, uh, Stuckley, uh, Suckley, sorry, um, was FDR's like best lady pal friend um so uh, it has all kinds of uh, fdr uh, uh juju all over the uh, uh property the uh, his that dog fa so sorry for don't the touch language anything there. yes um uh no uh, it's a very fascinating relationship between the two um there's a movie made about that with bill murray that i talked about previously that's not very factual uh, unfortunately but um uh, it's just a fascinating um kind of little slice of americana beautiful tour um, and they've been renovating uh, and uh, and keeping it up. Uh, the second floor is kind of uh, still uh, under construction, kind of. But you can see how these uh, places are. It's just really nice. It's a very, very nice tour. The Wilst Wilderstein Historic Site. And yes, it may take you down a rabbit hole of strange, uh, affectionate, extramarital relationships of, uh, of past presidents. 
Uh, that's all the time for extramarital stuff that we have on this podcast. Uh, listen to all of our podcasts at reason.com slash podcasts. Uh, you can donate to our business at reason.com slash donate. Uh, Nick, do we have anything that you would like to advertise uh, here about your activities in New York City or the Reason Foundation's activities in New York City? Uh, yeah, Reason is going to be premiering a great documentary about Backpage.com. Uh, the classified online classified ad uh, uh, site that got attacked by the federal government and drove one of the proprietors of it to suicide. Uh, that'll be in late July. If you go to reason.com slash events, you can buy tickets. Uh, we're going to have a, a showing of the film, and then we're going to have a panel discussion with Elizabeth Nolan Brown, who did a lot of our coverage of Backpage, as well as Caitlin Bailey, uh, who's the head of a sex workers rights group called old pros um so go to reason.com slash events or sign up for our nyc events newsletter at reason.com slash newsletters terrific thanks for listening everybody we'll see you next week